Good news. I studied for the right chapter this time. So, uh, like Rod said, we will be in Acts chapter 21. You can go ahead and turn there if you'd like. Or click there, whatever you want. It's good to see you guys. I'm in a walking around mood, so hopefully I'll stay in the frame, but if I don't, oh well. Uh, have you guys been enjoying the journey through Acts? We're getting pretty close to the end. We're going to have to figure out what we're going to do after that. You know, as I was going through this and just praying over it and stuff, I, I, I'm just thinking about all of the things that Paul's going through and the people that are traveling with him are going through and the extreme circumstances, the extreme situations that they get put in. And I was just praying this morning and I was reminded of, of the greatest commandment. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love others as yourself. The other, you know, the other one is just like it. The Bible says to love others as ourselves. If we're loving others as ourselves, what would you do to save your own life? If you knew you were going to die, you knew you were going to suffer a painful, agonizing death, and then deal with that throughout all eternity, and you knew it, and you knew that you could change it, wouldn't you? Of course we would. Most of us in here have already made that decision. But we're to love others as ourselves. If you love yourself so much that you're not willing to go suffer an eternity in torment in hell in separation from Jesus Christ and God the Father, then to love others as you love yourself, then you also don't want other people to have to suffer that torment and separation from Jesus Christ and God the Father. As we go through Acts, and we're watching what Paul's doing. It doesn't make sense to the human mind. In a rational thinking mind, if you're thinking from a human standpoint, he gets warned over and over. We're about to see where he gets warned over and over. You're going to go get taken by the, the Jewish leaders. You're going to be handed over to the Gentiles. What happens then? We all know what happens then because we're out here preaching about what happens then. What happened to our Savior? What happened to Jesus? You know what's going to happen, dude. Don't go there in a human mind. This chapter is going to break down some really interesting things. Honestly, whenever I first started reading through it, I'm like, man, God, there's some hard things in here to have to try to get across in a way that, that a, a large congregation is going to be able to understand what you're saying in this, in this passage. Honestly, a lot in this chapter, or at least a few things, are things that for most of my life, I have just read it and just whoop, skipped right over because... I didn't take the time to let it sink in. It's like, I don't really understand that, so I'm not going to take the time to try to figure it out. I'm just being honest with you. And then he's like, yeah, but I want you to teach it now. <laughs> you know? Oh, okay. I see what you're doing here. All right. Hopefully, hopefully I will do... Um, 
God some justice here. Hopefully he does justice through me, ultimately. Most of this is going to be out of the New Living Translation. There are some things in here that, that it may word things a little bit differently in yours. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you will have your way today. That you'll do what you want to do, God. Holy Spirit, we just invite you into our into this time, Lord. I invite you into our minds and into our hearts and into our our understanding, Lord. And I pray that you will accomplish what you want to accomplish today, Lord. In Jesus' name. All right, so Acts 21. Whoops, I just powered it off. Technology. Acts 21, verses 1 through 4. After saying farewell to the Ephesian elders, we sailed straight to the island of Kos. The next day, we reached Rhodes and then went to Patera. There we boarded a ship, sailing for Phoenicia. We sighted the island of Cyprus, passed it on our left, and landed at the harbor of Tyre in Syria. That's where the ship had to unload some cargo. We went ashore, found local believers, so other Christians there, and stayed with them a week. These believers prophesied through the Holy Spirit that Paul should not go on to Jerusalem. So this, we don't know really who evangelized Tyre. But, as he's talking here, he says, we found some believers, we stayed with them, which had to be pretty cool for them, right? They're they're seeing the fruit of their work all throughout this region. They get to stay with them, and the believers there, some of them even prophesied, it says, through the Holy Spirit that Paul would not, should not go on to Jerusalem. This is pretty controversial, so let me break it down a little bit. I say it's controversial because Paul's already been told a couple different times, you're going to Jerusalem, by the Holy Spirit telling him. So, whenever we read this, it's like, what? Is this a contradiction? But, these people, as, as they're, they're prophesying these things, We know that in Acts 20, verse 22 through 23, that, he, that Paul himself had been told that he's going to Jerusalem. So it would almost seem like a warning to not go to Jerusalem. Um, but this was a human interpretation of what the Holy Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit's prophecy of the danger that awaited Paul. So have you ever, I know we talked about this a couple weeks ago in Bibles and Brunch, and James and I have had a pretty in-depth conversation about this too, where uh, sometimes people that receive a prophecy, they try to put their own twist on it. Remember, you brought that up, and, and you're like, don't, don't try to put your own twist on it. You don't need to. Just speak what God tells you to speak. Don't try to put your own twist on it. And we see here a couple different times as we go through this, we're going to see Humans put their own twist on this thing. Some, some commentators, as I'm studying through this, some commentators literally believe that Paul was in direct rebellion to, uh, by continuing on to Jerusalem because of what this says, that they were prophesying through the Holy Spirit to not go on. But Acts um, 9.16 says that Paul in Acts, Chapter 9, verse 16, Jesus says that Paul will be an instrument for Jesus, and Jesus will show him how much he has to suffer for his name's sake. He said, so if Jesus is going to show him how much he must suffer for his name's sake, we automatically think, well, he's going to show us through the suffering. Like he's going to suffer, and that's going to tell him. But this says that God's showing him, telling him beforehand how much he's going to have to suffer whenever he gets there. He's preparing him in advance. So I just think that it's interesting. So these people 
they have these heartfelt pleas to Paul, and they're asking him to not go. But his group didn't turn away from going to Jerusalem because he was persuaded that it was God's will. So he continued on. Acts 21, 7 through 9 says, The next stop after leaving Tyre and some other place I can't pronounce, uh, where we, we were greeted by brothers and sisters uh, and stayed there for one day. The next day we went on to Caesarea and stayed at the home of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven men who had been chosen to distribute food. He had four unmarried or four virgin daughters who had the gift of prophecy. Now, I love this. I think that this, this section right here where it's talking about Philip, Luke is, is pointing back, Luke and Paul are pointing back to who this guy is. They don't just say Philip. There's sometimes in the Bible where it just mentions a name, and you're not real clear. Is it this person? Is it this person? Is it somebody totally different that we don't know anything about? But he takes time to actually identify who this is. So remember whenever uh, the early church, the disciples or apostles, they're, they're trying to preach and teach and all this stuff, but then the widows and the orphans are being left behind, and so they're coming to the disciples. They're like, you guys need to fix this. You guys need to do this. And they said, wait, let's, let's appoint some people that we can trust. Philip is one of the people that they appointed that they could trust. And this shows that this is, this is many years later, many, many years after that, that it shows that he goes on and he's still successful. All right? Uh, they call him Philip the Evangelist. And he was one of the seven. So that you can find that story in Acts chapter 8, verse 20. And it tells us that after... Um, Philip's work in bringing the Ethiopian eunuch to faith, he preached through the coastal region and ended up in Caesarea. So you can kind of track these people's lives. I don't know. I, th I think that, that stuff's really interesting. But then, what a great title to have, especially for these guys that are writing this to, to talk about you that way. I mean, it's just an absolute honor for him. Uh, he's, he's known by the good news that he presented to other people, the good news about Jesus. Then it goes on and it says that he had four unmarried or four virgin daughters who prophesied. This is super um, kind of personal to me because whenever I think about it, um, Brittany talked a little bit about Azrael's life and whenever God really just, boom, impacted her and made this this dramatic transformation in her life. He didn't just change her life, which pulled her out of a very dark, difficult situation that she was in, a very dark, difficult struggle that she was going through, but he also touched her life in multiple different ways, and one of those ways was actually giving her a gift of prophecy. Like, I've, I've watched her prophesy to multiple people, complete strangers, you know? She's I think the first time I saw you do that, you were what, 16, 15, 16, something like that, down in Houston? Oh my goodness. Just goes up and starts reading this lady's mail, you know? She just starts bawling, grabs her, hugs her, and just, I mean, God uses people to go up and speak directly to them through us, if we're willing. And, and it's a gift. It's a gift. And my daughter has that gift, so I kind of I, uh, I can relate with Philip here on that. Something else that I was thinking about, though, is it's not unusual for some churches and some Christians in the, uh, around the world today to try to say that women have no place uh, in the gifts of the Spirit or even in, um, in the church. You know, they're like, well, women are to remain silent, and they pull out this one verse, you know. I had somebody tell me they really wanted me to preach on that one day. Um, I'm like, I will, but I don't think it's going to end up like you think it's going to end up, <laughs> you know. Um, but anyway, I won't get way deep into it, but these, these women are 
prophetess. They're literally speaking out God's word. And it's interesting that they had the gift of prophecy. It's written right here that they have the gift of prophecy, but they don't prophesy to Paul that he shouldn't go to Jerusalem. Multiple people do, but the four that they list right here don't. Does anybody else find that interesting? Like, he, he lists out the gift of prophecy, that they have it, but they don't use it. And he doesn't even say anything about what they, what they do. But um, one of the commentators that I was reading said that according to some ancient records, the daughters, or at least some of them, lived to a great age and were highly esteemed as informants on persons and events belonging to the early years of the Judean, uh, to Judean Christianity. So I don't know exactly what um, records that he was talking about. He didn't list them out. But apparently he had found records that literally talked about these ladies and that they were highly esteemed because of the, the gifts that God had given them to speak out and bring his word. So Acts 21, 10 through 14, several days later, a man named Agabus, who also had the gift of prophecy, arrived from Judea. So he came in from another town. He came over, took Paul's belt, and bound his own feet and hands with it. Then he said, the Holy Spirit declares... So shall the owner of this belt be bound by the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem and turned over to the Gentiles. Luke goes on and he writes, When we heard this, we and the local believers all begged Paul not to go to Jerusalem. But he said, Why all this weeping? You are breaking my heart. I am ready not only to be jailed at Jerusalem, but even to die for the sake of the Lord Jesus. When it was clear that he couldn't be persuaded, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. So this Agabus, he's being led to go find Paul to show him he must suffer for Jesus' namesake. I love how he uses an Old Testament prophet's style by taking something and utilizing it as like a, um, what do you call it? What's that? A prop. Thank you. He's using it as a prop to represent what's going to happen. He's taking Paul's own belt, ties up his hands and feet. That'd be a little odd, like picture me tying my hands and feet up here and then telling him, this is going to happen to you, man. Like, if you go to Jerusalem, this is what's going to happen. But the prophecy of Agabus was true, and it really was from the Holy Spirit. But this true word, to this true word, the people there, and even his own followers, put their own spin on it. And decided to bring their own interpretation. What does this mean? This must mean you shouldn't go. Because something we don't see something good coming out of it. We see bad coming out of it. So it must mean that you shouldn't go. It's a warning to not go, Paul. Don't you understand? It's pretty stinking clear. Don't go. He has people that love him, that are trying to dissuade him from doing what he knows beyond the shadow of a doubt God has called him to do. Do you think that they were doing this to be mean? No, they were doing it because they love him. They don't want him to be hurt. They don't want him to suffer. Some of them are going with him. They don't want to be hurt. They don't want to suffer. You know? They pleaded with him to not go to Jerusalem. Now, if this other word that they added on to it, to not go, was of the Lord, Paul would have been disobedient. He would be disobeying. Have you ever been given a word from God or direction from God and you knew that you should do something, but people that you love, you trust, you confide in, maybe they're your, uh, your spiritual leaders, 
Maybe they're your accountability partners and you go to them and you talk to them about it and they're like, no, you definitely shouldn't do that. Maybe they, maybe they even heard from the Lord of, of some sort. Brittany and I have had good, solid, awesome leaders that we trust and respect very much so tell us that we shouldn't do something that we knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that God told us to do it and no, it didn't make sense. It didn't. I'll tell you right now. I don't know that hardly anybody agreed with us. Family, friends, people didn't agree. But God told us, then he confirmed it through his word, then he confirmed it through somebody that brought a, a word, of no, word of knowledge, and we knew, we knew that we had to go no matter what. Like, okay, I get it, it doesn't make sense, but, and you don't agree, and I love you, but we must agree to disagree, because I know that God told me. And he used us in ways that we're still finding out. You know, I will be quite honest, it was pretty devastating while we were there, uh, and things were not easy. They were super difficult. They were really tough on our family, on our children, on us personally, on other people. But now we get to see the fruit of our labor and what God was truly doing. But these people, they're trying to tell him, hey, don't. But Paul also had a lot of confirmation. So in Macedonia, he was told that he would suffer. In Tyre, he was told that he would suffer. And now in Caesarea, he's also told that he's going to suffer whenever he goes there. Even Luke... Dr. Luke, we love Luke, like he's, he's great, but even Luke at this point in time is his traveling companion and tells him not to go. But Agabus didn't tell him not to go. It says people of, of that area and his traveling companions. Agabus told him, you're going to suffer. <laughs> when you're going to get tied up, you're, you're going to suffer. But Agabus isn't listed in telling him not to go. I think that that's noteworthy that he wasn't one that was trying to get him to not go. So Paul's insistence on going to Jerusalem, despite the dangers predicted by the Holy Spirit, was not a result of rebellion, but an, an obedient response to the command of the Holy Spirit in his heart. He was compelled by the Holy Spirit it says, we find that in Acts 19.21, and he was bound in the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. We find that in Acts 20.22. 20, he was compelled by the Holy Spirit to go. He was bound by the Holy Spirit to go. The warnings that he's receiving from the Holy Spirit here in, in multiple different places, I don't think that they were... Well, I know that they weren't intended to keep him from going, but I think that they were intended to prepare him for what he was going to go through. Don't you know that if you're mentally and emotionally prepared for something, it's generally easier. If you know that you've got the Holy Spirit and God's on your side and he can help you, the word says that he's our helper and he leads us and guides us and all that stuff. He, he strengthens us. He's our place of refuge. He's our prince of peace. If you don't have time to prepare for something that's going to be pretty devastating, sometimes it can cause you to maybe not respond in the way that you normally would or should. But if you have time to think about it and pray into it and time to seek God's face, petition Him, pray, fast, all those things, then, then you know that He's going to help you through those times. So these things weren't to stop Him. I think that they were to prepare Him. And it says... Uh, Oh, this was something that um, I believe it was Oswald Chambers said. He says, to choose to suffer means that there's something wrong. To choose God's will, even if it means suffering, is a, is a very different thing. No healthy saint ever chooses suffering. He chooses God's will as Jesus did, whether it means suffering or not. You've, you've heard of people and different religions and stuff that, that choose suffering. They cause suffering. Remember the, um, uh, the Baal 
worshipers and the Baal priests and stuff that cut themselves and slash themselves and all that stuff, trying to cause suffering to get their God to do what they want him to do. That doesn't make any sense, especially whenever you know that the God of all the universe, the God that created everything, that created you for a purpose and a plan, that loves you so much that he calls us his children, clearly doesn't want you to suffer. He doesn't want you to physically hurt. He definitely doesn't want you to um, inflict your own physical pain. Now, he may allow us to go through suffering in order to get us where he wants us to be, where he knows is going to be better for us, but he certainly doesn't want us to choose suffering. Like, I would never choose for Azrael or Kyrie or Trinity or Tinley or my wife. I would never choose for them to choose suffering. That would never please me, ever, no matter what. It would never please me. It doesn't please our Father if we just randomly choose suffering, but it does please Him if we choose His will, even if it requires suffering. God's thoughts are above our thoughts. They're greater than our thoughts. His ways are far beyond our ways. He understands. He knows where He wants us to go. He knows the path. The Word says that He's a light to our path, a lamp to our feet. He's a, he's a very obvious cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He wants to lead us. And Brittany was going over the, um, the verse where it talks about God leads us by still waters. He causes us to lie down and rest, you know? We use that verse in, in funerals a lot. But I think that if we took more time thinking about that and meditating on that outside of death, we would probably be better off because it would give us a little bit better understanding of who He truly is and what He desires for us, where He wants to lead us where He wants to take us. Think about the Savior that Paul was willing to pay this price for. Think about the message that brought this willingness to go, even whenever he knows that he's going to suffer. He didn't just choose to go because he knew he was going to suffer. That wouldn't make any sense at all. He chose to go because he knew it was God's will to go. He knew that those people there needed to hear about the Savior, the only one that can save them. He says, the Lord's will be done. So these guys that are traveling with Paul, including Luke, came to the understanding that God's will would be done no matter what and that God would use it. There had to be a significant level of trust here with his followers. I would assume some of them probably left like some of Jesus' followers did. Maybe. It doesn't, it doesn't list it, but I would assume that they did. But there had to be a significant level of trust here between them and Paul and understanding that, listen, God, God hears from Paul at this point. Remember, Paul has... Is God is using him to do unusual miracles, raising people from the dead, and, and his shadow healing people. I mean, all kinds of weird stuff, you know, touching handkerchiefs and stuff that he had, and people are getting healed. It's, it's just pretty wild. But they, so they knew that God would use whatever was going to happen. <clears throat> but we often find that it's easy to judge God's will for someone else. I said we, because I assume that I'm not the only one. We find that it's easy for us to judge God's will for somebody else's life. I will tell you that it's easy to do, and it's a source of trouble when we add our own interpretation or application to what is thought to be a word from God, often thinking that it's also from the Lord. Us thinking, well, what I'm thinking makes sense, that that must be from God. 
So you must be wrong. That's dangerous, guys. It's super dangerous. And I would encourage you to never do that unless God, you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God has told you to intervene or put in your two cents. Imagine if God has a perfect purpose and plan for somebody and you step in and run your mouth and they don't do God's plan because of the knowledge that you have is so much greater. That's dangerous, man. I hope that I haven't done it. If I have done it, I pray that God forgives me and I pray that people don't listen to me when I do that. Acts 21, 15 through 16 says, or let's go through 20, 15 through 20. After this, we packed our things and left for Jerusalem. Some believers came from Caesarea accompanied, uh, accompanying us as they took us to the home of Manasseh a man originally from Cyprus and one of the early believers. This just means that, that well, I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory what it means. When we arrived, the brothers and sisters in Jerusalem welcomed us warmly. The next day, Paul went with us to meet with James. So James was uh, the brother of Jesus, and he was the leader of the Christian church in Jerusalem at that time. They went to meet with him, and all the elders of Jerusalem at the church were present. From the church were present. After greeting them, you got to understand in this culture, greeting people was kind of a big deal. And it took some time, so that's why they even put it in there. After greeting them, there was quite a reunion. You know, they hadn't seen him in a long time. After greeting them, Paul gave a detailed account of the things God had accomplished among the Gentiles through his ministry. After hearing this, they praised God, and then they said, You know, dear brother, how many thousands of Jews have also believed, and they all follow the law of Moses very seriously. So, whenever they're, they're having this conversation, remember all the people that came with Paul? A lot of them were Gentiles. And so they're meeting with James, they're meeting with the elders, and they're saying, God is touching these Gentiles too. Like you guys are sitting here in Jerusalem, mostly surrounded by Jews, you know, and, and uh, Messianic Jews now. They're, they're Christians, but they're still from that Jewish culture and everything. Where Paul and these guys have been going, they've been going out into Gentile lands. And God has been touching these Gentiles. They've heard about it here, but they just haven't experienced it a whole lot. They even say, man, thousands of Jews are coming to the full knowledge and understanding of Jesus Christ and coming into this intimate personal relationship with Him. Isn't that incredible? And they're like, yes, that's incredible. And while they're telling Him this, they're seeing these Gentile brothers that Paul and, and these guys are bringing with them. And by seeing them, it's a confirmation that they have truly been changed as well. They saw some of these Gentiles and they could tell that their genuine love for and commitment of Jesus. They could tell that they genuinely loved and were committed to Jesus. It goes on in verse 21 through 22. It says, But the Jewish believers here in Jerusalem have been told that you are teaching all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn their backs on the laws of Moses. They've heard that you teach them not to circumcise their children or follow other Jewish customs. What should we do? They will certainly hear that you have come. So like I said, this, this community, this Jewish community within Jerusalem, they were, it was mostly Jews. But they were Jews that, that converted to Christianity, but they still maintained Jewish laws and customs. They were still very zealous for the law because they were still Jews. But based on Romans 14, verse 4 through 12, and, and remember, they asked him, they said, what should we do? This is probably James speaking, and 
James already has a plan, okay? It's kind of like he's one of those guys that doesn't ask a question that he doesn't have an answer to already. But he's setting the stage, letting him know, we're going to have to do something here. Like, we really don't want you crucified up at Golgotha. We're going to do something about it. But if you, if you look at Romans 14, verses 4 through 12, it kind of lays out that Paul didn't have a problem with Jewish Christians who wanted to, uh, to continue to observe old customs and laws. It seemed that he himself also did sometimes as well. If you remember in Acts chapter 18, verses 18 through 21, he took a vow and fulfilled a vow of consecration where he, he shaved his head. So most people believe that it was a Nazarite vow. It was coming to conclusion, so he shaved his head as an outward expression of upholding the vow that he said that he was going to take. Well, that was a Jewish tradition. It wasn't law. It was a custom. It was a tradition that he followed, and he was following that. Okay? But... Paul seemed fine with, with Jews that wanted to continue this as long as they didn't think it made them more right before God. That's the key here. And if you follow Paul's, Paul's life and his, his teachings, you can pull that out and you can actually see that uh, by contextualizing it, you can see that, you know what? If you want to continue these things, that's fine, but don't let it supersede what Jesus Christ has done for you. It doesn't add to your salvation. It doesn't make you more righteous anymore. You can't be more righteous. It's okay to follow these laws and customs as long as you don't rely on them to get you closer to God because they will not get you closer to God. So whenever he says, um, what then? Let's do, he's basically saying, let's do something about this, James was. And it says in Acts 21, 23 through 25, it says, Here's what we want you to do. We have four men here who have completed their vow. Very simple. Probably, quite possibly the same vow that Paul took. I'm not saying that it is, but whenever we see what happens here, it looks really, really similar to the one that we just talked about. It says, we have four men here who have completed their vow. Go with them to the temple and join them in the purification ceremony, paying for them to have their heads ritually shaved then everyone will know that the rumors are all false and that you yourself observe the Jewish laws. As for the Gentile believers, they should do what we already told them in, in a letter. They should abstain from eating from food offered to idols, from consuming blood or the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. Paul was a Jew. So they said, take these these Jewish Christians to the temple, go through the Jewish uh, rituals, the, the laws, follow the laws there, participate, pay for it, because where your treasure is, <laughs> you know, there your heart's going to be able pay for it so that they see that you're paying for it, and it'll prove that you're not who all these rumors say that you are. But we know who we're dealing with here, though, don't we? Like, we're dealing with people that they don't really care about the, uh, the truth. They care about the rumors. They want, they want to move forward with that. So, where he says that they will all know. I want you to do this so that they will all know. These Jerusalem elders believed that this would convince everyone that Paul did not preach against Jewish laws and customs for those Christians who wanted to observe them. That's the key, though, for those who wanted to observe them. They weren't held to the standard that they must observe them. But concerning the Gentiles who believe, I love how they, they've already ruled on this. They've already made the, the judgment. They've already been led by the Holy Spirit. They asked God. They sought Him. And He said, no, these Gentiles don't have to follow the Jewish rituals, laws, and all that stuff. They, just, they simply don't have to. If they want to, that's up to them. They don't have to. But they had already made that pretty clear. Now, the elders understood that this had nothing to do with the Gentiles. So whenever he's telling them to go and do this, 
They knew that it had nothing to do with the Gentiles who believed in Jesus, and but if they were trying to push that off on them, Paul would have rightly refused to compromise on this important point because we know he fought this battle before. He's already fought that battle, and so we know that he would. It's just a, it's a pattern of behavior. We know that he would have fought that. So Paul went to the temple, though, the next day with the other men. They had already started the purification ritual, so he publicly announced the date when their vows would end and sacrifices would be offered for each of them. So, I, I will tell you though, a lot, a lot of commentators believe that this was a terrible compromise that Paul was making. They truly do believe that this was a horrible compromise on Paul's part, that he was being a hypocrite. But the motive behind Paul's sponsorship of these Christian Jews completing their Nazarite vow is explained in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 20. And this is what 1 Corinthians 9 verse 20 says. And it says, And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. And to those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. He's letting them know, I'm not being a hypocrite. I'm coming alongside people in whatever their convictions are. He further goes on and, and talks about how if, if somebody thinks, actually, let me, I'm going to pull it up real quick. 1 Corinthians 9.20. I don't want to, I don't want to misquote it, but I do think that it's important. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who follow the Jewish law, I too lived under that law, even though I am not subject to the law. I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law so I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the laws of God. I obey the law of Christ. I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. He says, when I am with those who are weak, I share in their weaknesses, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and to share in its blessings. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. But we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing or, or boxing the wind, some translations say. I discipline my body like an athlete training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I may my... I myself might be disqualified. Guys, there's so many times where he's, he's talking about sharing in people's sufferings. The Word talks about when people rejoice, rejoice with them. When they mourn, mourn with them. Come alongside people. Be a support for them. Be what Jesus has called them to be. Whenever um, James tells him to go and pay for this, um, it... It talks about an offering, uh, a time of offering should be made. It's, it's important for us to understand that this offering, an animal sacrifice, was not in any way for the purposes of atonement or forgiveness. Paul absolutely understands that only the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross atones for sins. Yet not every sacrifice in the Jewish system was for atonement. Many were for thanksgiving or for dedication as this one was. This one was for dedication. Right after this, it starts to get into um, Paul going into Jerusalem, where he gets ready to be taken, and he is taken. And so I told Rod that I was going to leave that for him because 
it's kind of a weird stopping point. Like when he goes in there and he's having this conversation and stuff, um, it's a transition that rolls right into the next chapter. So I'm going to let him take that uh, whenever he preaches next. But I do want to bring out some similarities between Jesus and Paul uh, that you see in Acts chapter 20 and Acts chapter 21. These are some, some similarities, okay? I'm not trying to say Paul is Jesus or anything like that. I'm just, I, I just want to point out some of the things that Paul had to go through that were super similar to Jesus. And it's just super interesting. So like Jesus, Paul traveled to Jerusalem with a group of disciples. Like Jesus, Paul had opposition from hostile Jews who plotted against his life. Like Jesus, Paul made or received three successive predictions of his coming sufferings in Jerusalem, including being handed over to the Gentiles. Like Jesus, Paul had followers who tried to discourage him from getting to Jerusalem and the faith that awaited him there. Jesus had his own brothers even doing that. Like Jesus, Paul declared his readiness to lay his life down. Like Jesus, Paul was determined to complete his ministry and not be deflected from it. Like Jesus, Paul expressed his abandonment to the will of God. Paul had come to Jerusalem to give something. Like Jesus, Paul was unjustly arrested and on bias of a false accusation. Like Jesus, Paul alone was arrested, but none of his companions were arrested at that point in time. Like Jesus, Paul heard the mob crying out, away with him. And like Jesus, the Roman officers handed Paul's case, handling Paul's case, did not know his true identity. You'll find out that they thought that he was a, uh, uh, an Egyptian terrorist, basically, who took 4,000 warriors out into the wilderness. And like Jesus, Paul was associated with terrorists by a Roman official. A Roman official thought that Jesus was a terrorist too. These are very interesting similarities. So when we, we look at this and we're going through this, I think that it's, it's important for us to Try to associate our own lives. Are we doing anything that, that looks like Christ? Are we doing anything in life that, that other people think sounds a little crazy? Are we doing anything that, that might take us somewhere that could be dangerous? I know that we all have our own trials and tribulations. But I think that some of the trials and tribulations that we have, and this is just my speculation, some of the trials and tribulations that we have might not be the kind of trials and tribulations that Jesus was talking about whenever he says, in this life you're going to have trials and tribulations, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Are we against the world? Is the world against us? If the world's not against us, then we probably look a lot like the world. We probably don't look like a threat to the world. I'm not talking politics. I'm not. Politics probably have a little bit to do with it, but it certainly doesn't have a lot to do with it. I know our focus these days have been so much wrapped up into politics and this side versus that side and... and all that stuff, guys, I'm here to tell you that matters about this much. I mean, we have to pray for our leaders. The Word tells us to pray for our leaders. But I will tell you, the politics in this country, both sides are way off. They're just way off. We've got to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ, the author and the perfecter of our faith. And when we do, I venture to say both sides are going to be against us to a certain degree. The 
the waters are getting really muddy. Things have been polluted, diluted, tainted. And God has called us to be the light of the world. A city set on a hill. The salt of the earth. Have you ever got salt in your eyes? Things. It's things. Sometimes you're going to sting people's eyes if you're doing what God has called you to do. If you're being who He's called you to be. And if we truly do be who God's called us to be, even today, you could be handed over to the Gentiles. You could be persecuted. If you stand up and you say, I'm not going to let some trans person teach my children or my grandchildren. I'm not going to agree with that because it doesn't align with the Word of God. You can be persecuted. If you say, I'm not going to bake this cake for these people because it goes against my moral values and standards, you can be persecuted. If you say, you're not going to teach my kids that, it's not going to be in my libraries, you can be persecuted. Are you willing to be persecuted for what's right? Am I? Things are going to have to change. Things are changing, whether we like it or not. Are you willing to go to Jerusalem when everyone else is telling you not to? Because you know you're going to be bound. You know you're going to be tied up. You know there's a good chance you're going to die. The only hope that you have to stand on is God tells you that you're still going to Rome. But you were told that once. You're told to go to Jerusalem multiple times, and now several people that are God-fearing prophets that hear from God, that hear from the Holy Spirit, are telling you things are going to get real bad. Are we willing to go anyway? If you see somebody abusing someone else, being filthy, disgusting to them, being evil, are you willing to intervene and go step in and say, hey, stop, even if now you're going to be the one getting the brunt end of it? I can't tell you how sick and tired I am of seeing videos of people beating women or children or elderly people, and everybody's standing around videotaping it instead of doing anything about it. What is going on here? Is no one willing to stand up for what's right? When I was praying this morning, I was like, God, just do what you want to do. Say what you want to say. I know that each and every one of you, beyond the shadow of a doubt, have been created in the image and in the likeness of God. I know that you are unique. Every one of you are fearfully and wonderfully made. That fearfully means respectfully, with attention to detail. You were made. You might not like certain things about you, but you didn't create you. You were created for Him. You weren't even created for you. <laughs> you know? 
You really weren't. You were created for Him and for other people. And I don't care who you are, what place you are in life right now, whether you feel like you've got another hundred years to go or another year to go, I, it doesn't matter. If you're still here, you have an area of influence to affect. You still have a purpose. You still serve a purpose. Be willing to serve that purpose until the end, whatever that end looks like. Because only you can serve that purpose. God created you to be you. So be you. Be a bold, brave you. Be a willing you to go against the flow, against the grain, no matter what comes. And hopefully the rest of us will be right here with you, doing the same thing, fighting the same battle, shoulder to shoulder, using our shield to protect the one next to us, fighting through this thing. Because we are promised that when we step from this one to the next one, the next one's better. Way better. Way better. So no matter what comes, even if it's some crazy painful death because people don't like what we have to say or they don't like the way that we live representing God, so be it. I'll see you when we get there. I love you guys. Stay passionate. I encourage you to take time to just spend with the Holy Spirit and ask Him to lead you and guide you. Show you, give you a new revelation of who you've been created to be. And ask Him to give you the strength and the discipline, the self-discipline, to be that. To do that. No matter what it is, do it. Even if it sounds ridiculous. Even if you're like, they're all going to laugh at me. That's all right. Do it. Do it anyway.